Now that we've gone over some basics of manipulations of objects, let's talk about some additional functions that we use a lot in R. For example, there are several different functions for computing basic summary statistics. We'll start with the example of min. Min finds the minimum of a vector. For example, if you recall from the last video, the object my sequence is a sequence of numbers. We can find the minimum of that vector by typing min, open parentheses, and the name of the vector inside the parentheses. In this case, as we see here, the minimum of my dot sequence is zero. Similarly, there's a command called max, which finds the maximum value. And there's the command mean, which finds the mean, and median, which finds the median. I'm gonna select both of those lines in a block and run both of them at the same time, like this. Another useful command is quantile. This one takes two arguments. In addition to the name of the vector that you want to find a quantile for, you need to also put in the exact quantile that you want. So in this line, I'm going to find the 25th percentile, or quantile 0.25. Similarly, here's the 75th percentile. Another option is to use the summary function. We'll see summary in a couple of different instances later on in this program. But here, if you just put the vector, the, the name of a vector inside summary, it'll spit out the minimum, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, and the maximum. Two additional functions that are often useful are var, V-A-R, which stands for variance, and SD, which stands for standard deviation. Now before going on, I'm going to show you a trick that is sometimes helpful. Notice that I've filled up the console window with lots of different commands and other R code. If at any time you want to clear the console, if you type control L, it will do so. Moving on, it's also possible to create your own function. If there's some sort of operation that you want to do that R doesn't have a function for. Let's illustrate this example with a function called average. So this is going to be a function that computes the average or the mean of a vector. Now obviously there is a function to do this already in R. We saw the mean function just a few minutes ago. But in this case that will help us to make sure that our function works correctly. The first line in, in creating this function is to give it a name. In this case, I'm going to name the function average. And then we use the function function. Inside the parentheses for the function, we need to type the name of whatever input the function is going to take. In this case, I'm going to call that input the.vector because this function is going to take a vector. Next, type an open curly brace, which you see here. Notice down a few lines, there's also a closed curly brace. Everything inside the curly braces represents what the function is going to do to the input that I give it. In this case, I want the function to add up all of the elements in the vector, compute how many elements are in the vector, and then divide that sum by the number of elements, and that would produce the average. So here's how I do that. First, I create this object called s, which is using the sum command to add up all the elements in the vector. Next, I create an object called l, and to produce that object, I use the length command. The length command asks r to report how many elements are in that particular vector. Then I create an object called a, which is simply s divided by l, or the sum of all the elements in the vector, that's the object s, and l, which is the length of the vector, or the number of elements. And then finally, I type return, and in parentheses, the letter a. The return command tells r what we want 
this new function to spit out at the end. So remember up here, I told R what the function needs to take in. Down here, I tell R what the function should produce. And then here's our closed curly brace that closes the function. So the first thing we need to do is run that code. Then let's check to see what the mean command gives us for the vector my sequence that produces an average of five. Let's make sure that our new function called average also produces five. And here we see that it does, so we know that this function is working correctly. R also has very good capabilities for working with probability distributions. In particular, you can access the CDF or cumulative distribution function, the density function or PDF, a quantile function, and a random number generator for many different probability distributions. To keep all the options straight, you need to remember a prefix and a suffix for the various commands. There are four possible prefixes for commands that use probability distribution. One is the letter P, another one is the letter D, a third one is the letter Q, and a fourth is the letter R. Any command starting with P refers to the CDF of a particular distribution. Anything starting with D refers to the PDF or the density function. Anything that starts with Q represents the quantile function and commands that start with R represent a function to produce random draws from the distribution. The suffix gives the name of the distribution that you're working with. For example, norm, N-O-R-M, refers to the normal distribution. So for example, on this line here we have the command P norm. That means the CDF of the normal distribution. D norm is the PDF, Q norm is the quantile function, and R norm is drawing random values from the normal distribution. So beginning with P norm, we can compute the quantile associated with a particular value. For example, P norm 1.645 returns the value of about 0.95. The default setting for P norm is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So if I put no other numbers inside the command, R assumes that those are the values I want. But I could change that. For example, I could set the mean equal to eight and the standard deviation equal to two. And now when I run that value, it's going to look much different. The same defaults hold with D norm, Q norm, and R norm. D norm gives us the value of the density at a particular value, for example, 1.5. And Q norm is the inverse of the CDF. So it reverses what P norm does. If I type Q norm 0.95, I get back approximately the value 1.645. Again, that's assuming a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one because I didn't add any other arguments to that command. R norm draws random values from the normal distribution. The only input that's necessary with this function is the number of draws that you want to take. For example, R norm 10 produces 10 random numbers drawn from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Again, I could set the mean to something else if I wanted. Let's do one other example, this time with the binomial distribution. Binomial distribution takes a few different inputs. One is the number of trials. If we think of the binomial distribution as a series of coin flips, this is the number of times we're going to flip the coin. I'm going to set that equal to 50. I've got an object called trials, and I'm going to set it to the number 50 as we've seen before. 
Next, I'm gonna create an object called X that is a sequence of numbers from zero to the object trials, which is 50, counting by one. Notice I've used the SEQ command to do that. And then I'm gonna calculate the density of the binomial distribution at each of those values contained in this object X. So notice I've used the command D binome. D stands for density or the PDF function. And binome is the suffix used for the binomial distribution. The arguments in D binome are as follows. First, I've got the object X, which is my sequence of numbers. Then I'm gonna set the number of trials with the object trials, which is set to 50. And then the final argument that I have is 0.2, which is the probability of a success. In other words, the probability of getting a heads on one flip of a coin. So now using the dbinome command, I've computed the density of the binomial distribution with the parameter for the probability of success equal to 0.2 and the trials equal to 50 for every value between 0 and 50, every integer. And I can use the plot command to make a graph of that. I type plot, then x, which is my sequence of numbers, and y, which is the density of each of those numbers, and I click run. The result of this gets displayed in the plot window, which in my case is in the lower right pane of our studio. The X axis shows that sequence from zero to 50 that I created. And the Y axis shows the density of the binomial distribution at those particular values. Not surprisingly, the density is highest around the number 10 because 10 is 0.2 times 50. That is the expected value of the binomial distribution for those particular parameters. I could do this again using dbinome, but setting the probability parameter to 0.6. If I plot it again, I get the same graph, but now the peak of the density is at 30 on the x-axis. That is 30 successes out of 50. Again, because I set that probability parameter to 0.6. Finally, I could use the rbinome command to take a random sample from the binomial distribution. I'm gonna set the probability parameter back to 0.2, and I'm gonna keep the number of trials set to 50, which is in my object trials, and I'm gonna draw 100 random numbers. Then I can use the plot command again, but this time I'm gonna wrap it around the command density. Density is a command that does a kernel density estimate of a vector of numbers. In this case, the vector of random numbers that I drew from the binomial distribution. This produces a density plot that we see here, again on the x-axis, we have the number of trials, and the y-axis here shows the density, or the, the frequency of values. In this case, we see the peak of the density, or the most values from those random numbers, is pretty close to the number 10. It's not quite on number the number 10, but it's pretty close, which is what we would expect for a binomial distribution with a probability of success equal to 0.2 and the number of trials equal to 50. To get a look at the actual random numbers that we drew, we can simply type the name of the object, Z, and click Run. And here's our 100 random numbers. We see, for example, in the first time through, there were seven successes. The next time through, there were six, then eight, then seven, then 10, then 11. So it's a different number each time, but it is centered around 10, or it's always near the value of 10. In fact, we could even compute the mean, and we see that it's 9.75, pretty close to 10. This is what we would expect 
when the number of trials is set to 50 and the probability of success is set to 0.2. Now there's one important thing to keep in mind when using anything in R that uses random number generation, like the R binome or the R norm command. And that is that R and computers in general can't truly produce random numbers. So what they need to do is use a random number generator, which is a complex algorithm that produces numbers that look random. Now the thing with these random number generators is you want to start them at a particular number. And that's because you might want to reproduce the exact numbers that you got later. For example, if you come back to your R code or if you want to run it repeatedly. To start the random number generator at a particular number, use the set.seed command. Usually you want to put a large number inside the parentheses of the setSeed command. It doesn't matter too much which one it is, it just needs to be a large number. Then, anytime you do a random number generating command right after set seed, you'll get the same numbers. So for example, let's say I create this object k, which is a call to the command rnorm with 100 in the parentheses. That means 100 random deviates from the normal distribution. Again, notice I'm not setting the mean or standard deviation parameters, so it's just going to be a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And we can take a look at what I created there. There's my 100 random numbers from the normal distribution. Now let's say I set the seed again, just as I did before, to the exact same number, and produce that same object again. What you can see here is that I got the exact same numbers. Notice the first number in both cases is 0 0.8337317, for example. But if I just did rnorm100 one more time and then printed it out, now I've got a different set of numbers. So if you want to be able to reproduce the exact set of random numbers that you got, make sure you use the set.seed command. Coming up in the next video, we'll talk more about loading data into R and working with that data to do statistical analyses.